Well, my name is Gerald Fadiomi, and it really is a privilege to be with you all this morning. Uh, my wife and I were laying in bed last night, and we got pretty emotional thinking about this church. Uh, my parents go to this church actually here on this side, about six rows back. Um, man, uh, I gave my life to Jesus at this church. Um, I was baptized in that baptismal here. I volunteered for the first time at this church. I learned how to preach at this church, and I met my wife at this church. And so I'm so incredibly grateful uh, to be with you all this morning. It truly, truly, truly is a gift. Uh, I now have the privilege of pastoring a church uh, just down the road in Roswell, um, and Andy invited me to come back today, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'll tell you, greater, uh, a greater privilege for me than any of that, though, uh, is I have the privilege of, of getting to be a dad and a husband. Uh, and so I brought a picture of my family. Uh, this is them. Uh, that's my wife, Kylie, and our three girls, uh, Wesley and Zoe. They're identical twins. And then our third, her name is Trinity. And uh, we named her Trinity because that was our way of theologically closing the circle on girls. <laughs> Uh, it's our way of telling God, hey, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, she's done. Okay, no more girls, you know? Um, and so if we have another, y'all pray, it's a boy. Also, if, if it's not, just pray for me because I have three girls, two and under, in my house. And so that's mayhem. Um, but I love them. And I love getting to spend time with them and love getting to be their dad. Um, the last couple of years, I've gotten to be home a lot more. I traveled a lot in 2019 and then 2020 hit. Um, and like all of us, we experienced a pandemic. And so I was at home a lot more with our girls over the last couple of years. Um, that really has been a gift. But can I also just be honest this morning? Um, I've been at home with my girls and my wife a lot. And um, there are moments where I just want to drop kick my kids in the throat. You know what I'm saying? Like. Some of y'all are like, you can't say that, but you've thought it, so don't judge me, okay? Um, yeah, I love my kids, but there are moments where they just drive me a little crazy, and the inverse of that is also true. There's moments where I drive them, and especially my wife, a little bit crazy. There's some little things about me, some little odysseys about me, some unique things about me. I think just drives my wife up the wall. There's one thing in particular, and some of the other fellows in the room, you may be able to relate to this, um, but there's this one thing I do that kind of drives her crazy. We'll be sitting on the couch, we'll put the girls down for a nap or down for bed. Maybe we're watching a show, and I'll get like a little stir crazy or a little anxious, and so I'll get off the couch, and uh, I'll just start like pacing around my house, you know? And eventually, I will wander my way into the kitchen, and uh, I'll open up the fridge and take a look. I'll close it. I'll go over to the pantry. I'll open that up, look. I'll close it. And I'll go back to the fridge as if there's now something new in the fridge. <laughs> I'll open it up, look. And as I'm doing this, I can literally feel my wife's blood beginning to boil in the other room, you know? And she'll scream out from the other room without fail anytime I do this. She'll go, Gerald, babe. What are you looking for? And I'm like, babe, I don't know. I'm looking for something awesome. You keep putting all this gluten-free stuff in my house so I can't find anything good. Like, I don't know, but I'm looking for something. I was thinking about those moments and the reality that I was sitting on the couch perfectly content, but then for some reason I get this feeling where I feel a little unsettled, or maybe a better word is I feel unsatisfied. And so I get off the couch and I start looking around the house for something to satisfy this void that I'm feeling at the moment. And so my wife wisely asks the question, hey, babe, what are you looking for to satisfy you right now? And that's the question I want to start with this morning. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you looking for to satisfy you in this life? wrote down a list of maybe a couple of things. Maybe for some of you, the thing that you're looking for is hope. As you turn on the news, it doesn't matter what news network you turn on. You get on the Facebook or Twitter, and it just feels like the world is hopeless. It feels like everything's spinning out of control, and you're like, where in this world can I find or experience hope? Maybe you're looking for belonging. Maybe you never really feel, felt like you fit in with your family and holidays are super difficult for you because you don't feel like you're, like you're a part or maybe you just moved here or moved wherever you are and you're in a context where you don't really have friends yet and you're trying to figure out who your people are and so you're just looking for a place to belong. Maybe you're looking for peace. Maybe there's a lot of tension and drama in your family or, or things are just really complicated or you and your spouse seem to be at war and it's a war that's been going on for years and you're like, I cannot figure out how to experience peace in this life. Maybe you're looking for joy. I had a friend say to me the other day that it feels like the world is just gray with pops of color. 
rather than a world full of color with moments of gray. And you're like, I'm more depressed or anxious than I've ever been, and, and I just want to feel joy again. Maybe you're looking for acceptance, for someone to approve of you, to welcome you as you are. Maybe you're looking for a connection with God, and you've tried all different sorts of things, and all of the things you've tried have just left you empty, and you can't seem to figure it out. Or maybe you feel like I felt on the couch that day, getting up and looking in the fridge, you're like, I don't know exactly what it is that I'm looking for, but I know that there's a void. I know that there's something missing, and I'm not sure what it is, but I know that I need to find it. Well, here, here's what I know is just true of the human condition. We're all looking for something, aren't we? And the thing that you're looking for is different than the person sitting next to you, but we're all looking for something. And so since that's true for you, and since it's true for me, and since it's true for all of us who are watching online, it brings me to this deep concern for you and for me, and honestly for our world in general, and it's this, that we might be looking for all of the right things in all of the wrong places. That we're looking for all of the right things in all of the wrong places. Hear me. Looking for hope and belonging and peace and joy and acceptance and a connection with God. Like those are all good and right things to look for. But my concern is that we're looking for all of those things in all the wrong places. And when we do that, what I've just seen to be true in my short 32 years of life is this. That looking for the right things in the wrong places will always lead you to worse things, won't it? This leads you to worse things. When you look for the right thing in the wrong place, you find shame instead. When you look for the right thing in the wrong place, you find disappointment, regret, depression at a higher level than you could ever imagine, anxiety. Like when you look for the right things in the wrong places, isn't it true that you just find yourself more unsatisfied than when you started? Say it like this, that the right desire plus the wrong place will only lead you to an unsatisfied life. And if we're honest, that's where a lot of us are in the room this morning, isn't it? Like, I don't know what context everyone else is in, but can I just speak to the room right now? You're in Alpharetta, maybe some of you in the Roswell area where I am. We live in some of the wealthiest zip codes in the world. The world would look at all of the things we have and go, there's no way that you could want something more, yet still, somehow, we find ourselves feeling like there's something missing. You can pinpoint an area of your life where you find yourself feeling unsatisfied and maybe it's because we're looking for the right thing in the wrong place and it's led to this unsatisfied life. So what do we do with that? What do we do with this feeling of unsatisfaction and where do we seem to find it? That's what I wanna wrestle with this morning. To do that, we're gonna look at the story of a woman that if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard before. Her story is found in John chapter four. Uh, and it's the story of the woman at the well. Uh, the book of John is written by, I'm gonna let y'all guess this. Who do you think it's written by? John. Y'all are gold star students, amazing. It's written by John. Uh, John was one of the disciples of Jesus, one of his 12. He walked with him, he talked with him, he did life with him, but, but more than being one of his 12, he was actually in Jesus's inner circle. And John writes this account of the life and the story of Jesus. And he says at the end, the reason he's writing this account is that we may believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he really is the savior of the world and he really does love us. And as we look at John chapter four, what we're gonna see is that John points to this truth that Jesus is the savior of the world. But not only that, but he might just be the solution to this unsatisfied feeling that we have. So we're gonna read John chapter four, verses one through 29. We're going to read verses 1 through 26, straight through, all gas, no breaks. Talk about it for a bit, and then we'll get back to the end, 27 through 29. So let's read it together. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, I'll read it to you. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back to went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. If you have a Bible, you should circle or underline that word, had. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near a plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, uh, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? For his disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How could you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that asked you for a drink, 
you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself and as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered her, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will, uh, will, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, well, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, okay, well, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands and the man that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Duh. <laughs> Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. Now she's changing the subject because she's uncomfortable. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this is the place where we must worship, where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, side note, only Jesus can get away with saying that. <laughs> now, don't try that at home. It's not gonna go well for you. <laughs> Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ, the Savior, is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. There's a lot to unpack in those 26 verses, but the first thing that stands out to me is actually in verse Four. Now, verses one through three set the context of what we're reading. Uh, John the Baptist had been baptizing people in the Jordan River, call, calling them to repent from their sins, to turn away from the life that they were living. But he would always declare that there was one coming after him who was greater than him. And Jesus shows up on the scene and he goes, that's the guy, that's who I've been talking about. And John moves his ministry further north and Jesus takes over in the southern region. Uh, he continues in this ministry of repentance and his disciples begin baptizing people the same way that John had baptized people. Now, the Pharisees are extremely frustrated by this. John the Baptist has already caused quite a ruckus. People are coming from left and right to be baptized. And now there's this Jesus who's greater than John and more and more people are coming and they are fuming about it. So Jesus makes the wise decision to leave the area that he is in, in Judea, and head north to the Sea of Galilee. And that's where we run into verse four, where it says this. Now he had to go through Samaria. I was reading through this and that word had made me pause for a moment for a couple of reasons. One, because who are we talking about right now? Not rhetorical, help me out. Jesus. We're talking about Jesus, which as Christians, we believe that Jesus is God, a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when we're talking about God, we are talking, or when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about God. We're talking about the creator of the world, that all things were made by him, for him, and through him. So when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about God. So that word had is really difficult to understand because if he's God, he does not have to do anything. That Jesus doesn't have to do anything that he does not choose to do. So it should cause us to pause for that reason, but it should also cause us to pause because when you understand the cultural context of what we're reading, you go, that doesn't make any sense at all. Let me show you a quick little map to help you understand. So Jesus is in the southern region, Judea, near Jerusalem. He's headed north to the Sea of Galilee, near Nazareth. And this center line that we see here is the route that Jesus took to get there which on the surface seems to make a lot of sense to us, right? Because the fastest route from point A to point B is what? A straight line. And so we look at this and we go, yeah, that makes sense. Like that's the fastest way to get there. Except for culturally, what we know is that Jewish people would never take this route, especially not a Jewish rabbi, because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Jews didn't like Samaritans because there were these Jewish people who had intermingled with Gentile people so they'd water down the Jewish race. 
But not only have they watered down the Jewish race, they'd also watered down the Jewish religion. And so socially, racially, and religiously, Jews and Samaritans wanted nothing to do with each other. So most Jewish people would have taken this route over the Jordan River, back over the Jordan River, and added days to their journey to avoid ever running into coming in contact with a Samaritan person. They did not like each other at all. Yet Jesus takes this unconventional route through a city of people that would have been hated by people like him. And the question is why? Well, that word had to in the original language, had actually translates better, it was necessary. And so the reason that Jesus takes this route is because it was necessary for him to go to Samaria because there was a person in mind that he needed to meet. There was a woman who he knew he would run into at this well, and the conversation with her would not only save her, but it would lead to the salvation of many of her people. Jesus would not let race, gender, reputation, social norms, politics, or religion keep him from meeting with this person who he had in mind to meet. Now, why are we talking about that? Why did I spend so much time talking about that idea? Here's why. Because for many of you, you're in the room or you're watching online and you're going, how did I get here? Like, how did I end up in the room this morning? And maybe you've written it off to to circumstance. Oh, I just happen to live in this community and people have been inviting me. My neighbor's been inviting me forever. And so I just finally said yes so that they would stop asking. And that might be true, but can I just submit to you that maybe it's a little bit deeper than that? For some of you, you're in the room and you're like, oh, it's just coincidence. Like the universe is just working together and I just ended up here. And and I hear you when you say that, but can I just submit to you, maybe it's better than that? Like I think the reason that you're sitting in this room is because of this word called providence. It's the plan of God. That before the foundations of the world, God was thinking about you and he imagined that you would be sitting in this room on this day because he wanted to meet with you. That he wants to speak to you today. That he wants to unearth some things in you today. He wants to challenge some things in you today. He wants to meet with you. And it doesn't matter your past, your story, your reputation, the mistakes you've made, the places you've, you've gone, the things you hope no one in this room would ever find out about you. God still chooses. He wants to meet with you. And in the same way he met with the woman at the well, he chose to eliminate some obstacles so he could meet you here. And that's really good news for you and for me, but it's also a little bit terrifying, isn't it? Because for the Christians in the room, I don't know about you, but when I feel like I've met with God, he usually challenges me, he usually convicts me, he usually causes me to rethink some perspectives and change some behaviors. And so while I believe that God wants to meet with you, I think he wants to meet with you because there's some things in you he wants you to wrestle wrestle with, especially as it relates to your satisfaction. And so Jesus goes through Samaria and he sits and meets with this woman at the well. He sits down, he's tired from his journey. It's about 20 miles that he walks. And tired, he asks this woman for a drink. I was gonna have something to drink. She goes, I'm sorry, um, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. You you do realize we're not supposed to be having this conversation. Uh, This isn't supposed to be happening right now. Not only are you a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, but, but also you're a man and I'm a woman. And most scholars would say that a Jewish rabbi wouldn't even be allowed to talk to a woman that he's related to in public, yet alone a Samaritan woman. And so according to all social norms, this conversation isn't supposed to be happening, so she's confused. Like, why are you talking to me right now? And I imagine Jesus smiles and he goes, "Uh, if only you knew who you were talking to. If you knew who you were talking to, you instead would have asked me for a drink and I would have given you a living water. She's like, living water? Dude, you don't even have a bucket. (laughs) And the well is dead. Deep. Some scholars say it's about 100 feet deep. So how are you going get to get access or get a hold of this living water? And on top of that, do you think you're better than Jacob, who's a patriarch in both the Jewish and Samaritan faith? She's going, you think you're better than one of your forefathers? Because he gave us this well, and he drank from this well, and his sons drank from this well, and his livestock drank from this well, and we've been drinking from this well for hundreds of years. Like, who do you think you are? You know, if you drink from this well, you'll get thirsty again, right? 
But if you would come to me, I'd give you a water that would make you never thirst again. It'd be like streams of living water bursting up inside of you, welling up to eternal life. Now, she still thinks he's talking about water, and so she's so confused. But she's like, if, I mean, if you have that, that sounds awesome. So if you got that kind of water, hook me up, bro. I need some of that in my life. A water that'll never make me thirsty again? Come on. Now, she asks for this water for a couple of reasons. One, because, like, who wouldn't want a glass of water that would make you never thirst again? Like, that sounds amazing. But not only that, this, the text tells us that she was coming to get water around noon, which we know in, in the cultural context that it's the hottest part of the day. And so she's coming to get water at the hottest part of the day. And what we find by looking at her story is the reason that she's doing this is because of her past. It's because of her reputation. It's because she's had these five husbands and she's ashamed of who she's become. You see, getting the water from the well was the work of the women in that community, and most of the women would have gone to get water around dawn. Now, I'm not stereotyping. Don't throw stones at me. Don't, like, write an email to Andy afterwards. I'm just saying for a moment, imagine a bunch of women at a water well at dawn. Something's happening there. What do you think it is? Talking. And she's the talk of the town. So she doesn't want to be there. So to avoid the conversation and to avoid the judgment, she goes and gets water at the hottest part of the day, hoping that she won't have to run into anyone. So when she asks, hey, if you got this kind of water that's gonna like eternally, like I'm never gonna get thirsty again, you got that, then give me that because I'm sick and tired of having to hide out and come and get water at the hottest part of the day. I'm tired of who I am and I'm tired of my shame and I'm tired of living like this. And this is where Jesus takes a really weird turn. And he goes, oh, okay, cool. I got you, you want that water? Go get your husband real quick. And she's like, um, you see what had happened was, <laughs> yeah, I, ooh, I don't really have one of those. And Jesus is like, yeah, I know. You've had five, and the guy that you're living with now, he's not even your husband. And it's like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, I thought we were talking about water. Oh, like, Jesus, why did you just take this, like, super savage turn? Like, why did you just start calling out, like, her past? Like, I thought you were supposed to be love. I thought you were just like, you know, wearing Birkenstocks and hand, holding a baby sheep and just like, yeah, I love you, dude, you know? <laughs> well, like, what, what is this? Why are you bringing up her sin and her shame and her power? Like, what are you doing? This seems so harsh. Hear me when I say this this morning. This isn't harsh at all. In fact, it's the most loving thing that Jesus could do for this woman. Let me give you two reasons why. One. You cannot experientially know or appreciate the grace of God until you realize just how much you need it. You cannot experientially know and appreciate the grace of God until you realize, man, I am really broken. I'm really messed up. But like, I can't even live up to the standard that I set for myself, yet alone the standard that God has for me. And every time I try to get it right, I do the things that I know I'm not supposed to do, and I don't do the things that I know I'm supposed to do, and I just find myself in this, like, bad rotation, bad habit of, like, doing all of the things that I know aren't good for me. Like, I am so messed up, and I am so broken, and I can't help myself. I think I need a savior. And it's in that space that you go, oh, thank you, God, that you would love me so much, that you would send your son to die for me, you see, Jesus addressing her sin is not meant to be harsh or cruel or hateful. It's to bring her to a place that we all have to get to where we realize I need help. I cannot do this by myself. I need someone greater and bigger than me. You cannot experientially know and appreciate God's love and his grace for you until you get to a place where you realize I need a savior. So it's not harsh, it's loving. Second reason why is this. You cannot be fully loved until you're fully known. And for many of you, that's the tragedy of your life. Is that you've spent your whole life being what everyone else needs you to be so that you can be loved and accepted and valued, but the reality is none of the people in your life actually know the real you. And you've had moments where you've laid in your bed and thought, if they knew this about me, they wouldn't want to be my friend. If they knew this about my past, there's no way they'd want to be in a relationship with me. He'd break up with me immediately. She'd leave me immediately. If my spouse ever found out this about me, there's no way they would want me. And so you live with people knowing part of you, but not all of you. And if they only know part of you and not all of you, they, then they can't love all of you. And the same is true with God. 
except for he does know all of you. And he sits by the well and calls out the most intimate, devastating, difficult part of this woman's story. The thing that she's most ashamed of, the thing that caused her to reorient her whole life to never run into another person. And he sits at the well and he goes, I know. And get this, and I'm still at the well. And I'm still sitting here. I know everything that there is to know about you and I still choose you. You cannot be fully loved until you are fully known and God knows everything about her and everything about you and he chooses to love you anyway. Now, it seems like this is a random term, but I would argue that this isn't random at all. This is actually really connected. This whole time Jesus has been talking about water and now he gets to this woman's past and the five husbands that she's had and now the sixth guy that she's with. And I think where the connection lies is in this is that Jesus knows that this woman has been running the wells her whole life. And the well that she'd been running to was the well of relationship. She got into one relationship and that marriage didn't work, so she went to the next relationship and that marriage didn't work, so she goes to the next one and the next one and the next one. And now she's on the sixth relationship and Jesus is going, how long are you gonna keep living like that? How long are you gonna keep living that kind of life? Like eventually the, end, the relationship's gonna end with the sixth guy and what are you gonna do? You're gonna go on to another one? She goes, he goes, come on, like, you do realize that in every relationship, the problem isn't the other person. The problem is that you bring you to every relationship. My dad who's in the room said to me one time, he goes, hey, you realize that every room, if every room you walk into smells, the room doesn't smell, it's you. <laughs> right? You're gonna bring yourself to every relationship, so how long are you gonna keep settling for living like this before you look in the mirror and realize you need something better? need something greater. She's been running to this well of relationship and the well keeps running dry. And so here's the question for you this morning. It's this, what well are you running to? What well are you running to to satisfy your soul? What thing do you keep going to thinking that it's gonna satisfy and it keeps running dry over and over and over and over and over again? And maybe it's not the fifth marriage, maybe it's the fifth business. What thing is it that you keep going to thinking it can satisfy your soul and it ultimately will just fail you over and over again? I wrote a few questions to help you identify what wells those are. Here's the first one. What do you find your identity in? What things do you say make you you? And I would argue that somewhere in there is a well that you are running to to satisfy you. And can I just let you in on a secret? It's not gonna last. Second question. What do you turn to when life gets hard? How are you coping? Because it may satisfy for a moment, but it will not last. Third question, fill in the blank. You should take a picture of these and process these with your spouse or with a friend later. But third question is this. If I just had blank, I'd be happy. How do you fill in that blank? I'll give you some examples of how you might. For some of you, the well that you are running to is the well of social media. And I know that seems so petty, compared to like some of the things that are in the room, but can I just say that social media is the reason that many of you are addicted to your phone, and can I tell you why? It's because they designed it that way. They designed it that it would give you momentary, or it would give you some moments of satisfaction, you feel satisfied momentarily, and then that satisfaction runs dry, and you know what you do? Refresh, scroll, post another picture for another light so you can get another shot of endorphins and it satisfies you for a moment and then it runs dry and you keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again and it does not last. They designed it for it to not last. And you're addicted, but can't satisfy your soul. For some of you, the well that you're running to is a well of substance. And when life gets difficult, the way that you would answer that question, you turn to a pill or drug or alcohol bottle and it takes away the pain for a moment it may numb you for a moment it may help you get through the night or the weekend you might even have a blast while you're doing it but can we like is this a place where we can be like real real when you do that it doesn't satisfy does it no you just end up at the end of the weekend waking up with the same problems and a hangover to go with it 
right? It doesn't satisfy your soul. It just feels good for a moment. For some of you, the well is the well of career, and you've built a phenomenal business, or you're the CEO of the company, or you worked your way up the corporate ladder, and everyone looks up to you, and everyone thinks you have your life figured out, but the second you close your door and you're by yourself for a moment, there's this wrestling in you where you're like, there has to be something more than this. I have all the accolades, all the prestige, all the wealth in the world, yet this, it still feels like there's something missing. I feel so unsatisfied, because hear me, your business and your career cannot satisfy your soul. It may look good from the outside and it may feel good for a moment, but it does not last. For some of you, it's the well that this woman ran to. It's the well of relationship. And you date guy after guy after guy after guy or girl after girl after girl after girl or marriage after marriage after marriage after marriage and you're going, the problem was them and then it wasn't them, it was the next person. Like, they were a little bit better but the problem was them and the next person and your problem is the same problem that she has. You haven't realized yet that it's you in every relationship. And it's time for you to look in the mirror and go, they cannot be the solution to my unsatisfied life. It has to be something more than that. For some of you, it's achievement. And I could go on and on and on and give example of example of example of, of example. But we keep running to these wells thinking they can satisfy our soul and they will continuously run dry. This is a really silly example. So bear with me for a moment. Um, but hopefully it'll help you remember what we talked about today. Does anyone know what this is? Not a trick question. Come on, y'all are geniuses in this room. I don't know if they are at Brownsbridge, but y'all, come on. It's a water bottle. And um, just go with me for a second. Let's just say I were to go for a run, which will literally never happen in my life, but let's just say, <laughs> hypothetically, that I did. If I went for a run, at the end of the run, if I was tired and thirsty and I picked one of these up and drank it, you know what it would do? It would quench my thirst. It would satisfy me for the moment. But the problem is that would only last for a moment, right? Because you know this, drinking this will not satisfy my thirst long term. I will get thirsty again, won't I? It's the reason that they don't sell these in one packs. They sell them in 12 and 24 and 30. It'd be a terrible business model to give you one bottle of water that would satisfy you forever. They can't do that. You'll have to keep coming back over and over and over again to quench your thirst. Friends, hear me, this is social media. This is the substance you've settled for. This is the career you've built. It's the relationship you've been in. It's the achievement that you're after. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And so the question for us is how long are we going to settle for a water, bo water bottle type life when Jesus has come to offer us, and I know this is cheesy, but just go with me. When Jesus has come to offer us this, he's going... You know this isn't going to last. You know this is going to run out. So how long are you going to settle for this when I've come to give you life, into the, life to the full? How long are you going to settle for a cheap substitute when you instead could have the source? Because this is filled up by this. So you're going to keep settling for a water bottle type life where you have to run the thing after thing after thing, hoping that it'll quench your thirst, hoping that it'll satisfy you, hoping that it'll give you the thing that you're looking for, when in actuality, I've come that you could stand under this and you could just drink and drink and drink and drink and you can open wide and it's never going to run out. It's just going to keep going and going and going and going. And so you will not find yourself thirsty standing under the waterfall. But we keep settling for this. And Jesus goes, no, I've come to offer you so much more. Now hear me, if this is what Jesus was offering, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? That's not what he's offering at all. No, it's way better than that. Jesus' invitation is not to stand under the waterfall. No, he says, if you would come to me, I would fill you with this living water that would be like springs bursting up inside of you, welling up to eternal life. You see, the promise from Jesus is not that you stand under the waterfall. The promise from Jesus is that he puts the waterfall in you and by his spirit, he will fill you up in such a way that you will experience purpose and life and meaning and joy and hope and acceptance and belonging in a way that you could have never even imagined. The picture of what Jesus is offering is not come find another thing that will satisfy you for a moment. The picture that Jesus is offering is I want to give you something that will sustain you through this life. And so he goes, don't settle for this. 
Don't settle for a cheap substitute. Don't settle for a temporary thing that can never satisfy your soul. I love what Oswald, Oswald Chambers says about this idea. He wrote this. He says, the man or woman who does, not, who does not know God demands an infinite satisfaction from other human beings or other things which cannot give, which they cannot give. And in the case of that man, he becomes tyrannical and cruel. I love this. It springs from this one thing, that the human heart must have satisfaction. You will always crave it. But there's only one being who can satisfy the last abyss of the human heart, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the big idea. Temporary things will never lead to long-term satisfaction. The things of this world, the money, the success, the fame, the relationships, the house, the car. Because, yeah, they may feel good for a moment, but they will not last. Satisfaction can never come from these things. Hear me, ultimate satisfaction comes from one place. It comes from the source, and the source has a name, and his name is Jesus. So if you're looking for hope, can I submit to you that maybe you stop looking to CNN and Fox News because you're never going to find hope there? Maybe you look to the source of eternal hope who says to us the end of this life is not the end, who says I've come to give you life to the full, who says in me you can experience the fullness of life not just in eternity but right now today. He is the source of hope. If you're looking for belonging, can I just say to you that your friends will come and go. You've seen that. Family members will pass away, but you've been invited not to a church. You've been invited into a family where God calls you a son or a daughter. Hear me, the church is not a thing you attend. You know that, right? The church is a family you've been invited to participate in. You've been adopted into the family of God. There is no greater belonging than that. If you're looking for peace, Scripture tells us we can have a peace that passes all understanding, and you've seen it. It's the person who's diagnosed with cancer, and they still have peace, and you're going, how in the world can you have peace? You have cancer. It's the person who, who's looking at the world, and it's spinning out of control, and they're unshaken and unbothered. Can I get in your business for a second? It's the person whose presidential candidate didn't win, and they go, oh, I'm fine. And you're like, how? And they go, oh, you think the president is my king. No, my citizenship is in heaven, and I serve a different king. And his kingdom is unshaken, so I'm good. That peace is possible for you and for me. If you're looking for joy, we can have joy even in the middle of chaos. You see, the world offers us this thing called happiness, and that's fleeting. It doesn't last. But what Jesus has come to offer you is a joy that can sustain you even in the most difficult seasons. If you're looking for acceptance, Jesus goes, I'll give you a new name. You're a son. You're a daughter. If you're looking for a connection with God, he says this of himself. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. Jesus' declaration of his own life, I'm paraphrasing, is this. I am the source. It's me. So if you're looking for hope and joy and love and peace and acceptance and belonging in this life, you come to the source. I love Augustine's confession. He says this. He says, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless, meaning we will be unsatisfied until they find rest in you. Ultimate satisfaction comes from one place. It comes from the source and his name is Jesus, and that's exactly what this woman experiences in this moment. We'll wrap up with verse 27 through 29. It says this. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to a woman, but no one asked, what, what do you want, or why are you talking to her? They knew better than the question Jesus. 28. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who's told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah. I've heard this story and read it hundreds of times, but verse 28, I skipped over every time, and I don't know how I've missed it. Then leaving her water jar, question, why did she come to the well? <laughs> then leaving her water jar. So this woman who came to the well to get water leaves her bucket behind, runs back into the city and goes, y'all, you're not gonna believe this. 
The woman who's going to the well at noon because she's ashamed of who she's been now leaves her shame at the feet of Jesus and goes and proclaims his goodness to her, her city. She goes from hiding out to in the spotlight. How does this happen? Her leaving her bucket behind tells us this. She was so full spiritually after sitting with Jesus that it was like the natural physical things of this world did not matter anymore. And she no longer had to live in shame. She had now been set free and she runs back into the city and she's like, y'all, you're not gonna believe this. I met a guy to which they're like, not again, not again. (laughs) Shut up, shut up. I met a guy and he told me everything I've ever done, to which some lady in the back is like, everyone knows everything you've ever done. You've had five husbands and now you're with Bruno and we don't talk about Bruno, you know? (laughs) Shut up. I met a guy who told me everything I've ever done. I think, yeah, I think this is the Messiah. And what we see next is that many in that city would go and they would meet Jesus and they would give their life to him. They'd put their faith in him. And the woman who's ashamed is now a proclaimer of the good news of Jesus. How does this happen? She experiences the satisfaction of Jesus in her life. And y'all, that's what's on the table for you and for me. So how do we experience that? Two quick things, and I'll be out your here. Directly from the text, the first is this. Spend time with Jesus. You want to experience satisfaction from Jesus? All you have to do is spend time with him. The story of the woman at the well isn't the story of a woman who got her life together. It's not the story of a woman who had it all figured out. It's not the story of a woman with perfect behavior. In fact, at the point that she meets Jesus, her life is still a mess, yet she experiences his satisfaction and it changes everything for her. And so maybe this week it's opening this book for yourself. Maybe this week it's praying for the first time in a long time. Maybe this week it's getting back into a group after you've left. Maybe it's, it's taking some time to actually invest in your own relationship with God and spend time with Jesus. Or the second is this, maybe it's time for you to live on mission. You see, for a lot of us in the room, we've had these well moments with Jesus where we realize that it's only him and him alone who can satisfy us. The problem for a lot of us is that we're still sitting at the well. And you're not gonna continue to experience the satisfaction of Jesus if you're still sitting at the well. Maybe it's time for you to get up and run back into the city and run back into your company and run back into your family and tell some people of how good God has been to you. He saved me, he can save you, he loved me, he loves you, he changed me, he can change you. There's hope in Jesus. So friends, don't settle for this when you can have a waterfall like faith and experience. Jesus. Only the source can satisfy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we love you, and we're grateful um, that you don't leave us to figure out this thing called life on our own, but rather you took on human flesh and bones, and you demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were still broken, while we were still messed up, not when we figured it out, you died for us so we could experience life and life to the full in you. So thank you for loving us in that way and forgive us for the moments where we choose the things of this world over you. Forgive us for the moments where we've settled for temporary instead of eternal. Forgive us for the moments where we bought into the lie that the things of this world could satisfy us when you are the only one who can. So today we declare that you're enough and we choose you and we'll follow you and we will not turn back. Only you can satisfy, and we love you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.